Hello everyone. I'm Jim Daly and we're here for our monthly training at Daly Manufacturing. And we're glad you're listening to this either live or on YouTube. Uh, we are available both ways. Now I want to point out that YouTube will be there anytime you want to see us. You can go 24 seven. I would encourage you to sign up with YouTube to our channel so that you can get notifications uh, and you'll know what's coming up uh, every month. We encourage you to share the YouTube videos with friends. Uh, you can send them a link to them if you think they'll benefit from them. But we're going to make this available for as many people who would like to as would like to see it. Now I want to tell you before we get into our main talk about a couple of products. Every month I want to show some of the new products to you. So I'll grab a couple here. This is one of the newer products. It's our flaxseed oil. Now flaxseed oil is a vegetable oil that's rich in omega-3 fatty acids, one of the few of them. And it is a very good oil to use. In fact, the only two oils I really like that much uh, for most people are flax oil, olive oil, and for some people, coconut oil. Those three oils are, are pretty good, but the flax oil and the olive oil particularly, the flax oil because of the oils that are in it, the omega-3 fatty acids. The reason olive oil is good is not because of the oils in it really, but if you get the dark green olive oil, it's got a lot of good bioactive compounds in it. So I like those two oils. Now the coconut oil works good for some people because of the medium chain triglycerides in it that have some special uh, benefits. The other product I want to point out is our new Ageless Brain. And it is based on a lot of good research that supports the nutrients in here for brain function. And I really encourage you to take a look at that product. It does include the ingredients that we're talking about today, the vitamin B12 and uh, methylfolate, which we'll briefly talk about. Now, today's talk is kind of different um, because I really encourage people to eat a plant-based diet. But there are some things you have to be careful with with a plant-based diet. And the subject I'm talking about today, vitamin B12, is one of those. You really have to watch it if you're a vegetarian or a vegan because it's easy to become deficient in it. So I want you to just know right up front, I'm not saying that you shouldn't eat a plant-based diet. I, in fact, I'm a vegetarian myself. But I do say watch out for B12 because it can have some pretty profound effects if you're deficient in it. Um, in fact, I decided to look up the uh, other day what some really smart scientists might have said about nutrition. So I looked up to see if Albert Einstein had anything to say about it. Actually, he did. Nothing will benefit human health and increase the chances for survival of life on Earth as much as the evolution to a vegetarian diet. Okay, that's Albert Einstein. I'm not going to argue with him. He's pretty smart, smarter than me. <laughs> But uh, having said that, um, keep in mind that I'm a vegetarian. I encourage other people to be vegetarians, but I am trying to teach you a little bit about what you have to watch out for if you are a vegetarian and how to be healthy uh, as a vegetarian. So with that, we'll take a quick break and get right into our topic for today. Okay, our topic today is vitamin B12, and I'm calling it the brain vitamin. Now, it's really more than a brain vitamin, but that's what we're putting the greatest emphasis on today. And uh, you'll understand why as we go through this. Uh, question, how are you feeling? Are you feeling energetic? Are you uh, having a sharp mind, a quick wit, or are you tired, depressed, forgetful? 
and maybe you're all those latter things, even though you've changed to a healthy diet and lifestyle. So if you're up there and you're feeling energetic all the time, sharp mind, quick wit, well, you may not need this talk so much. <laughs> However, you still might want to watch it because you might know somebody that does need it. <laughs> so let's keep going here, even for you people out there. How about any of these symptoms? Depression, our mood impairment, irritability, insomnia, cognitive slowing, your cognition, your uh, mental clarity, forgetfulness, dementia, psychosis, visual disturbances, peripheral sensory deficits, um, weakness, uh, impaired position sense, impaired vibration sense, uh, a shock-like sensation that radiates to your feet, ataxia, which is you know, not being able to walk or move well, not good muscle control, uh, abnormal deep tension reflexes, um, and restless leg syndrome. That's interesting. A lot of people have that. But these are all symptoms of vitamin B12 deficiency. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily if you have one of these that you're B12 deficient because there's other things that cause these symptoms as well. But B12 is something you might want to look at if you don't have an explanation for some of these symptoms. You could have a vitamin B12 deficiency if you have symptoms like that. And that is something that's really worth considering. Let me read you a story. I don't read often uh, when I'm doing this, but I will today. And I've modified this slightly just so uh, I won't be infringing on in somebody else's uh, writing. But this came off the Internet, and it's only slightly modified, mostly to get rid of the names and to clean up the English just a bit, actually. <laughs> but here we go. And this is a woman writing from um, up in the northeastern part of the United States. That late August morning, as I filled out my paperwork as a new patient and got to the section where you can write down your concerns uh, that you want to speak to the doctor about, I, it was like I was writing a novel. I was surprised at the length of the bulleted list after rereading what I had written. The way I felt physically and mentally that day apathetic, agitated, low energy, lethargic. I felt I needed to lay everything out there. And so she did. During the initial exam with the nurse, uh, Jay, um, before seeing the doctor, uh, she randomly assured me that Dr. M was very thorough. Well, two days later, I received a call from Dr. M herself. As I was walking across the street from my office to get to the, some morning coffee, she told me I was profoundly B12 deficient and that you will be feeling much better in a few weeks. She prescribed to me uh, to start a series of muscular injections immediately, one shot a day for four consecutive days, and then uh, once a month. And then we'd, she said we'd assess whether or not I needed to keep taking them. After Briefly explaining how this finding made me sense, given the multitude of symptoms, I felt a huge sense of relief. I remember thinking in a moment, uh, standing in the blustery New York sunshine, finally, maybe somebody really discovered what's wrong with me. Um, my thing referring to all-knowing gut feeling that there was something bigger, something deeper wrong within me a feeling I've always had but could never prove. From the first chance I had to Google about this new finding, I was continually amazed at what I was discovering. As I read various articles and snippets, I would always think, that's so me, uh, referring to symptoms or ailments that is a direct uh, result of B12 deficiency. Tingling, numbness in hands, legs, feet, loss of memory, never feeling refreshed after adequate sleep, lack of concentration and focus, foggy brain, chronic fatigue, chronic low energy, depression, shortness of breath, incontinence, weird bouts of constipation and diarrhea, bleeding gums, geographic and occasional sore tongue, 
trouble keeping balance often seems it seem, seeming as a clumsiness, my legs giving out from under me with no explanation, and more that would be discovered over time. She was really having a hard time. <laughs> and um, fortunately, she found the answer. A few people have asked me if the injections hurt. They gave me mine in my arm and was not painful at all, maybe a bit sore later on. In fact, the first three injections I did not feel at all. From the B12 deficiency, I had significantly lost sensitivity to even being able to feel a shot being given. I can tell you I do not have that B12, much of a B12 deficiency. I know shots. <laughs> I was shocked at the difference when I received my fourth shot of being able to feel the needle where before I felt nothing. From my first injection each day, I remember feeling different and experiencing odd things in new ways. Even within a week of my first injection, I was a completely different person. From my energy levels, my sleeping, my legs not hurting, mental clarity, and just overall feeling of wellness, I was amazed that what I was experiencing prior to the injection wasn't normal because it had seemed normal for me. I couldn't remember feeling any other way. And there's more to the story, and, but we'll stop right there. You know, this woman had lived her whole life uh, suffering with B12 deficiency. As it turned out, she had something called pernicious anemia. And we'll talk a little bit about how that works. Basically, it's a type of anemia that results from not being able to absorb vitamin B12. And, and we'll talk about that down the road here in this talk in just a minute. So, oh, I'm going the wrong direction. Sorry about that. Um, let's talk about B12 and why it's important. First of all, we are made up, and if you look at the chart here, we're 80% carbon by dry weight. If you take all the water out of us, what's left is mostly carbon, 80% of it. Well, as it turns out, vitamin B12 utilizes carbon. It's what makes carbon work for us. It takes these carbon uh, atoms and builds things in the body. And that's where we get an awful lot of the uh, things that make us work. Uh, you've heard of S-adenosyl methionine or SAM-E? Well, SAM-E is a universal donor of these carbon groups, methyls we call them. They're absolutely required for life, and it's what uh, it's a major role of vitamin B12 to make these high energy carbons. And you can see on the um, right here the methyl group B12 puts it there. <laughs> That's what it does, and then this molecule can donate it to other um, molecules and build things like your neurotransmitters, proteins that make up your muscles, lots of different things. So there's very few systems in the body that are not vitamin B12 dependent. And this is just a sort of illustration of the single carbon mat metabolism that B12 is involved with. And it basically takes uh, carbons or methyl groups from uh, things like amino acids, taurine, choline, betaine. Uh, it goes through this uh, process that involves folate. Uh, it also involves um, niacin, B6. Several things, vitamins are in there, but really, the really crucial ones in this process that you have to watch out for are the B12 and also the folate. Uh, which is involved uh, right near the very first of it, here. So these are the crucial elements for making these uh, different molecules. Now, when we take vitamin B12, it goes through a process, and we can look at this. We, 
eat vitamin B12 and folic acid in our diets or we take them as supplements, they go to our stomach right here and you see intrinsic factor. Well, that's the key molecule. It's a glycoprotein that binds to B12, vitamin B12, and it stays attached to it all the way through the small intestine to right till the end, and then it helps transport vitamin B12 uh, across the mucosal barrier of the gut, and then it's absorbed and it can travel through the blood, it'll go to the liver that stores it, it'll go to all the different tissues. Well, the woman I just read about who is, had pernicious anemia, what that disease is, it's a genetic disease in which the person does not produce intrinsic factor. That's pernicious anemia. And it results in um, a very profound type of anemia. It can take a long time to develop sometimes, but it's very, very serious. In fact, people die from that disease uh, if it doesn't get diagnosed. That woman I was reading about, she was very fortunate to have survived as long as she did with pernicious anemia without it being diagnosed. It's, it's that uh, serious of a disease. But she was, had a very low quality of life because nobody caught it. Well, what about the brain in vitamin B12 deficiency? The entire body relies on B12, not just the brain. I have to make that clear. However, the brain is where the deficiency symptoms show up first. And that's why she was having all those feelings of lethargy, of no energy, of can't concentrate, because the brain seems to be where it has to, where those show up the quickest because it's highly reliant on B12 to make the neurotransmitters. Those are uh, very important uh, B12 dependent process. And also for making new brain cells, although that happens a little bit more slowly. The neurotransmitters, if they don't have B12, they don't get made right away. And you really start having depression, uh, no energy, lethargy, you can't concentrate because you can't make those neurotransmitters in the brain. Your brain doesn't function. Now, also, we know that there's a number of reasons why you can become vitamin uh, B12 deficient. Um, here we see uh, that brain levels of vitamin B12 really decrease with aging. And that's something you've got to really watch for because if you look over here at these charts, this is showing people who are 20 years old and the B12 levels in the blood, 21 to 40. You're seeing a lot of them decreasing at 41 to 60. And by the time you get 61 to 80, you know, you've got a real huge cluster with very low vitamin B12. We see the same kind of linear curve. Uh, pattern for methylcobalamin, one of the forms of B12 that's really important, you know, steeply declining with age. Um, the other graphs are a little bit hard to read, but they show the same pattern. So we see from this study that people as they age cons pretty consistently, but not universally, have a sharp decline in B12 levels. And that's overall, that's not just vegetarians, that's people in general. So that's something that you have to be aware of, that age really does affect your B12 uh, levels. And if they go down, you know, a lot of other things go with it. One of the important things that you have to uh, look for is homocysteine. And a lot of you have heard about homocysteine because it's a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and people make supplements for lowering homocysteine uh, with B12, folate, and B6 usually, those three combined. I would probably add niacin in there as well. However, homocysteine does more than just cause you to have an elevated risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, it's a non-protein amino acid, a homolog of cysteine, and it, what happens is in that pathway where I showed you a minute ago that uh, 
B12 is functioning to donate those carbons. If the B12 gets low, it doesn't complete that pattern, and homocysteine is part of that uh, cycle uh, that I showed you, and that will become elevated, and that was very, very dangerous to your body. Uh, homocysteine can be recycled to methionine, but it has to have B12 and folate to do it. So that's why you really um, run into problems with homocysteine very quickly. Now, what are some of the, we'll talk about folate for just a minute, and not for long, because it works hand in hand with B12. What causes folate deficiency? Well, same thing, it's pretty much that cause uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, although, it's not vegetarian diet, that's the exception. Vegetarians actually get quite a bit of folate usually. Uh, but poor diet, Crohn's disease, celiac disease, anything that affects your intestinal tract like that. Uh, but also genetic defects, different ones from the uh, ones that affect B12. Oral contraceptives can lower it. Alcohol lowers uh, folate. Um, so that's important. Also, there's a lot of emphasis right now on the form of folate you get, uh, methylfolate versus uh, folic acid. Folic acid is much less expensive, and it does work somewhat, but methylfolate is the active form of the B9 or the, the folate. Uh, often sold as folic acid uh, is the oxidized form that has to be reduced uh, in what we call a reduction reaction, which is a opposite of oxidized reaction, and it has to be converted in four steps, and often people don't make that conversion very well. So that's why the folate, uh, methyl folate like we sell is much better for some people. For other people it may not make as much difference, but there again, like all your activated B vitamins, some people can make those conversions better than others, and for some it's very important to get the activated forms. Uh, folate deficiencies, you see in the neural tube defects, megablastic anemia, which is the same as the B12, uh, pernicious anemia, actually. Uh, elevated homocysteine, just like with B12. <clears throat> All these things that you see in there are similar symptoms of B12 and folate deficiency. Now, let's go back to the brain and B12. Brain atrophy and cognitive decline was studied in what they called the Vitacog study. Uh, they showed that they could lower brain shrinkage over time by 53% by giving the subjects uh, folic acid, in this case, vitamin B6 and vitamin B12. And this was a longitudinal study, and this was in people. Uh, the supplement lowered homocysteine by 32%. And they found that it slowed brain shrinkage there again by about 50% or a little better. And cognitive decline was slowed in those people as well. One of the interesting things was, and it's a little bit hard to see from here, but you can see where the um, people are dropping off way over here on cognitive uh, test. You had to reach a threshold of brain matter loss before it really mattered. You could lose quite a bit of brain, you have quite a bit of brain shrinkage without being any effect as far as the cognition was concerned. But the damage was being done anyway. And so a lot of times <clears throat> they were pointing out that studies for a year or two don't show any benefits of vitamin B12 and folate on brain function. But they were saying it takes a lot longer than that before you'll see that in the brain function studies. You have the damage occurring, but you won't see the difference in the people as far as their cognitive ability until much further down the road. Now, this was another one that was hot, hot off the press. A recent article in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, female patients aged 50 to 80 with mild uh, cognitive impairments were studied. Um, the MCI patients had uh, low normal B12 and showed a significantly poor learning ability, the mild cognitively impaired MCI. 
Also, lower recognition performance, uh, and very significant uh, compared to people with high B vitamin B12. Also, the microstructure of the hippocampus was lower in patients with a low normal B12. Now, remember, we're talking about low normal, not deficient in this compared with people with high. It was making a difference if the people had high levels of B12 versus what would be considered on a diagnostic test as normal but in the lower normal range. So there's a difference between normal and optimal. With a lot of things on these tests, you'll find that with vitamin D, with vitamin B12, and a lot of things, you may be in a quote normal range, but if you're on the lower end of that range, you're still having some problems as a result. And that's what they were seeing here, is that patients who were low normal had, were having uh, brain loss and cognitive impairment compared to those with high B12. Well, uh, what about the symptoms of B12 deficiency? Well, many apply to folate as well, but what you'll really see a lot of times is red blood cell disorders, neurological disorders like we've talked about, changes in uh, mucosa of the digestive tract, and that may be what's causing the B12 deficiency as well. Um, 75 to 90 percent of the per people with a functional B12 deficiency have neurological disorders, and that's a huge. Interesting, the more severe the neurological disorders, the less severe the blood cell disorder for some reason, and nobody quite understands that. But anyway, that was something that they uh, pointed out. Uh, the most common neurological symptoms though were numbness, hands and feet going to sleep, and the unsteady gait and coordination. These are things that uh, somebody trying to assess them could actually observe. Uh, in these people. And you can see here uh, the difference between a person with a normal brain and one with Alzheimer's disease. They're actually having loss of brain matter in these patients. Uh, you can see on the one over here, quite a bit of the brain is actually gone. And, and that can be, you know, pretty profound effect. But as we said earlier, you can have quite a bit of loss over there before uh, the cognitive effects start showing up. Now, let's talk about the aging brain a little bit because we all know that as we get older, you know, sometimes we get more forgetful or something, and maybe some of that's normal. Maybe some of it's not. Um, but people seem to sort of consistently have cognitive loss as they age. People who are really sharp at an older age, they may have just been sharper to start with. However, the progression of cognitive loss can be uh, mitigated uh, and minimized. Uh, the other thing that we have with B12 in the central nervous system, which includes the brain and spinal column, is we all know about neural tube defects in uh, infants. This happens very early on. And folate, we've talked about a lot in that regard, but B12 can be a problem there too. And it's a very devastating um, neurological disorder that affects children profoundly for the rest of their lives if they have them. However, it happens in women very early, uh, before many of them even know they're pregnant. So it's really important to have good vitamin B12 and folate acid or folate status if there's any possibility of becoming pregnant. And I just wanted to throw that in there because it is of such importance that, you know, you really need to, to pay attention to that. So let's talk about just sort of single carbon metabolism, which involves B12, folate, uh, also, we said niacin and B6, and just sort of boil it down in a nutshell. Well, the major function of vitamin B12 and folate are to provide those high energy carbons we talked about. Both are common deficiencies in humans. Uh, deficiency disturbs brain, heart, gut, a lot of different systems. Vegetarians tend to be okay in folate, but often deficient in B12. However, almost anyone be, can be deficient in both of them. And supplements are both are 
probably the best way to obtain them uh, for very many people. And uh, just a little cartoon there. You know, she's saying that age has it as, as it's a, whew, uh, age has its advantages. Too bad I don't remember what they are. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that comes with age to some extent, but we know we can prevent a lot of that. Now, let's talk about brain pain from B12 deficiency. Well, what causes it? Uh, well, we know uh, pretty well what causes it, but what can prevent it? And can a healthy diet supply adequate B12 for everyone? What about traditional vegetarians. You know, there are people in the world who have for thousands of years been vegetarians and eaten vegetarian diets. Uh, people like uh, the Hindus in India are vegetarians. Uh, Buddhists, many Buddhists are vegetarians. Buddhist priests always are, uh, pretty much. And yet they seem to be getting along pretty well. Well, it's Difficult, though, to find a population of people that are traditionally total vegan. You know, Hindus are vegetarians, the Buddhist priests are vegetarians, but they're not vegans. They do get animal products. Dairy products do have B12 in them. So that's a source of B12 for those people. Even so, about 70% of the population uh, of India has low B12 status because the Hindus are all vegetarians at least. So a lot of them are not getting enough. Now some people think that seaweeds, yeast, fermented foods might have the B12 in them. Well they don't really to be honest. They sometimes have some similar molecules but so far they haven't identified any that really have B12 activity. They're close to B12 in their structure, but they're not B12. And there are no really good documented plant sources of B12 at this time. So to be a total vegan, you're going to have to find your uh, B12 somewhere other than just the, the plant foods. So let's move on. You can say, well, what about vegan primates, because all primates rely on B12. Uh, the golden lemur, who got a picture of there, um, they're strictly a fruit-eating animal. They don't uh, eat anything else. And however, when the National Zoo tried to establish a breeding colony of these uh, golden lemurs, they had a real problem. They wouldn't they wouldn't reproduce. They couldn't get baby lemurs from them. So that's a, a problem if you're trying to establish a colony of, of an animal. What they found out is that they could small, uh, feed them a small amount of meat and they could reproduce. Not a lot, but they needed a little bit of that B12. What they found out was that even though the lemurs only ate fruit, those particular lemurs, they got small amounts of insect worms and things like that associated with that fruit. You know. How many have ever bitten into an apple and found a worm? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's what's happening essentially to the lemurs. They're getting uh, some insects, worms, things like that in the fruit, enough to give them a little bit of B12, and that keeps them going. The uh, zoo, of course, was not doing that. They were making sure they had very pristine, nice fruit for them with no <laughs> worms or bugs, cleaned it up well, and actually that wasn't what they needed. <laughs> Well, also, there's some other things that happen with vitamin B12. There's a number of drugs that can really be a problem for you. Another reason why you could be eating a lot of meat and not getting your B12. Proton, proton pump inhibitors, Prilosec, Prevacid, Nexium, actually interfere with B12 absorption. Uh, the acid is needed in the stomach for the, um, to dissociate the B12 from what it's attached to in the foods and to allow it to bind to intrinsic factor. Without the acid there, it's in trouble. It can't be absorbed, it can't bind to the intrinsic factor, you don't get it. And acids can do the same thing. 
Also, and I don't know the mechanism of this for sure, but researchers found out that about 40% of type 2 diabetics who are using metformin are B12 deficient. Now, you know, metformin is a very common anti-diabetic drug. Uh, people take it even when they're not diabetic. You know, if, uh, a lot of people are started on metformin when they're in a pre-diabetic stage to help them regulate uh, blood sugar better. However, a lot of those people are becoming vitamin B12 deficient. That's a particular problem for diabetics because, you know, if you're becoming vitamin B12 deficient, then you're going to be making that homocysteine. Homocysteine, we saw, is a risk factor for brain problems. Okay. In fact, a very recent study showed, in experimental animals at least, that high homocysteine levels actually cause these neurofibrillary uh, tangles from tau protein in the brain to form. That's all they needed was that uh, high homocysteine, and they sort of spontaneously uh, made those neurofibrillary tangles in the brain. So this is a very big problem. These drugs are commonly used in our country, many, many people. And I can't imagine that people right here aren't using something there, or relatives at least, uh, of the proton pump inhibitors, the ones that decrease the acid in the stomach, or antacids, you know, chewing on tums. Um, or taking the anti-diabetic drugs uh, like metformin. So who's at the greatest risk of uh, uh, B12 deficiency? Well, older people. You know, we know that. Uh, and my age part pe uh, people are very commonly B12 deficient. And a lot of the times it's because uh, you don't produce acid in the stomach as well when you get older. So even without taking the proton pump inhibitors or the antacids, still, by the time you get to be my age, you're probably not producing acid like you should, and it's going to cause B12 deficiency in a lot of people. Vegetarian and vegans, like we said. And again, I really believe in a plant-based diet. So I encourage people to do that. However, you've got to find a way to get your B12. Um, Persons with gastrointestinal diseases consistently have problems with B12. Um, some people have a greater requirement for B12 than others. Pregnant women, uh, patients with autoimmune diseases or HIV infection need more B12 than normal people do, or people who do not have those conditions. I won't say they're not normal. Um, persons under long-term treatment with proton and pump inhibitors, you know, these are at great risk. Patients with renal disease often have problems with B12. And, of course, we know people with pernicious anemia. So all of these people, and this encompasses a big part of the population. So what B12 should be used? Well, there's a lot of different kinds of about cyanocobalamin is the least expensive and works pretty well for a lot of people. However, it may not be the ideal form. B12 is very large, so it's... Um, uh, you can just look at that and see the size of that molecule. Large, the largest molecule in nature that's not a polymer. So it's hard to absorb. That's why you have to have intrinsic factor. But there's several forms of B12. The cyanocobalamin, hydroxycobalamin uh, are two. The methylcobalamin and adenosylcobalamin are the two active forms, however. And these are your best ones to get. Um, Methylcobalamin is the most common form of active B12. It's uh, active in the cytosol of the cell. It, it um, participates in that cell cycle making SAMe we were talking about, and it lowers homocysteine. Deoxyadenosylcobalamin works a little differently, but it participates in rearrangement reactions and degradation of amino acids, threonine, valine, it can sort of detoxify a lot of things. Actually, it's involved in uh, metabolizing uh, other methyl groups. Uh, for instance, it's important for uh, if you drink methyl alcohol, B12 is what detoxifies that. And the reason you can get by with a little bit of methyl alcohol 
uh, without going blind is because your B12 will take care of it, but not, not, a, not if you drink a lot of it. You remember in World War II, the sailors drank uh, the torpedo fuel, which was methyl alcohol, and they went blind from it. <laughs> you can't do that. Your B12 can't keep up with that. But it does involve, it can take care of a little bit of it. So, which is the best one to take? Well, this study, uh, and you can uh, write that down if you want to, uh, they kind of reviewed that, and they concluded that the active forms, the methylcobalamine and the either high and the um, adenosyl cobalamine were really the best ones to take. The others are not bad, but the two that they really came up with in their conclusion that you wanted were the two active forms as being the ideal uh, supplement. When you compare the sublingual or the tablets or capsules or liquids, you know, it, the studies really teach us that it doesn't matter. The sublingual you can put in your mouth, but it'll dissolve there and go down your throat and be absorbed just like you swallowed it. So if you have a sublingual tablet, you can take it that way or you can swallow it. It'll, it's, uh, the, there's no difference in the blood levels after you take it. And that's what this study here was saying, that it didn't matter which way you took it. If you're taking the same amount, the blood levels of the B12 were the same. So that doesn't matter. Uh, and there again, they're showing the uh, concentrations in the blood of the different forms. It just didn't, you know, really there was no significant difference at all there. Uh, injections will get it there faster. However, a Canadian study said over time it really doesn't matter either. If you're taking a pretty good high dosage of it, you can take B12 because about 1% of B12 will be absorbed um, without the intrinsic factor. So you have to take a much, much higher dose of the B12 to get your get where you need to be. Um, but even with pernicious anemia, you can take uh, supplements that are high and you would need 500 to 1,000 micrograms a day of it if you have pernicious anemia to force enough through to avoid uh, injections. So that would work. Well, the bottom line for vitamin B12, everyone should be checked for vitamin B12 deficiency occasionally. You know, that's something you can do at a regular routine exam, see where it should be. You should check blood levels and methylmalonic acid. Some people will have normal blood levels of vitamin B12 and still be deficient. And, and that's why the MMA actually measures the amount that's functioning in the body. So that's important. Most, a lot of people will be picked up from, from the B12 blood levels, but not always. So I recommend that you really occasionally have the uh, MMA test. It's not as convenient. It's more expensive a little bit, but it's really better. So occasionally do that test. Uh, if very low, then you should check for pernicious anemia, and they can test to see if you're making the intrinsic factor or not, or do the genetic test whether or not you're able to make it. If that's, uh, if you're diagnosed with uh, pernicious anemia and you're really suffering from it, you'd probably get initially a few injections because it's going to get you up quicker. In fact, you know, if you're really suffering from pernicious anemia, you go to the doctor's office and get an injection, you'll know the difference before the day's over. It's that big of a difference really quickly. Um, if marginally low, just take the B12 supplements. That's fine. Um, but remember, there's no good plant source for it, for it. However, some people just hate taking capsules. There are foods that you can get that have B12 in them. I'll just show you, you know, something like uh, Marmite or Vegemite, that's a British product. They, it doesn't have it in there naturally, but they fortify it with B12. It's a yeast paste. Uh, some people like the taste, some don't. But you would need to take about one of these jars a week to get adequate B12. Uh, it's not a very big jar, so you could do it. However, 
that's going to be more expensive, really, than taking the supplement. So if you don't mind swallowing a capsule, you're better off taking something like daily activated B12. This is a large bottle. It'll last you a long time, and it'll give you plenty of it. Even if you have pernicious anemia, uh, you'd probably get enough in one capsule a day uh, to, to keep you adequate in B12. At the most, two capsules a day. So that's the, the bottom line for B12. If you're a vegan, you've got to get V12 from somewhere. And with that, we'll close, and I'm glad everybody joined us today and hope to see you next month.